Well, thank you all for, for coming. Thanks to, to Tom and Q and, and uh, the other hosts. And, and thanks to the CD fellows for coming. Um, it's, it's great to talk to you all. So um, what I'm going to talk about today is um, an older paper, but, but it's being revised. Um, and so any comments are, are really welcome. So it's joint work with Yu Yu Chen, who's at uh, Peking University, Suresh Naidu at Columbia, Ting Hua Yu, who's at Columbia, um, and me. Um, and, and the paper is about uh, social mobility in China over the 20th century and, and trying to link patterns in social mobility uh, to political institutions and, and policy changes over time. So uh, the, the starting point for the paper uh, is you know, sort of a, a growing literature on long run trends in inequality and social mobility. So um, a lot of work has been done documenting patterns of, of inequality over the long run um, in the US um, and, and that's you know, spread to the developing world as well, although I don't, I don't have so many sites on that right now. Um, and you know, beyond trying to understand something like earnings inequality or income inequality or wealth inequality, over time, uh, people have begun to, to study another aspect um, of, of the distribution of income or economic opportunity, which is social mobility. Um, and so again, there's a growing literature um, on patterns of social mobility over long periods of time, comparisons of social mobility uh, between countries. Um, and you know, one, you know, the, the evidence is mixed, I would say, on how much we can expect social mobility or inequality to be changed by, let's say, economic policies, institutional change, economic growth. Um, I think you can find empirical evidence saying that, that uh, social mobility is something that can be changed over time or does change over time or does differ across countries. Uh, but a lot of recent work has said, well, you know, over the very long run, if you look at general patterns, um, social mobility is something that's really hard to move around. It's, it's quite stubborn um, and it's, it's often quite low. So Greg Clark has come out with a, a really provocative book recently um, that says that, that social mobility is actually much lower uh, than we've thought from conventional measures um, and that it really doesn't change much. You can throw a, you know, a communist revolution at social mobility and that doesn't make it budge very much. Um, and, and so you know, th this sort of literature on comparative social mobility across time and across space um, is, is an area that, that we wanted to think about. Um, and, and so, you know, for, for especially the fellows here, uh, but, but maybe for, for even an academic, it's important to ask, like, why, why do we care, first of all, about patterns of social mobility um, or inequality? And I think, you know, for me, one reason is that we, we might care per se about inequality and, and economic opportunity. So I think that, that we oftentimes think about like economic growth or income per capita um, as the outcome variable we care about first and foremost, uh, but we might care about inequality and economic opportunity per se. Um, so, you know, beyond that, I would say that, that you know, economic opportunity and, and social mobility can tell us something about you know, our, our society and, and our political institutions. Um, and that, in turn, can tell us about you know, our economic trajectory, our economic opportunities um, as, as a country overall. So in, in a country that has relatively limited social mobility or economic opportunities, um, it may be the case that you don't actually draw from the full pool of talent available to you. It may be the case that you have an entrenched elite, um, which can lead to political problems, uh, potentially social unrest, um, and, and those things in turn affect growth uh, and, and income per capita. And so I think we both care about understanding, you know, what are the determinants of social mobility, what's the level of social mobility per se, and we care about it uh, because, because it, it's informative about, about growth opportunities and, and economic and political institutions that, that are sort of fundamental determinants of growth. Um, so why turn to economic history? Um, I think the, the reason is that you know, by looking back, we can, we can learn something about where we are today. We can learn something about what might you know, take where we are today and, and move it in some direction that we'd like to move. So you know, if it's the case that you're in China today and you say, OK, you know, right now economic inequality is growing. Um, it's creating a lot of social uh, division and, and you know, people are, are, are very concerned about it you know, on the ground in urban China and rural China. Um, is, is that social inequality, inequality in, in incomes and inequality in, in economic opportunities, is that something that might be offset uh, 
by opportunities for the next generation. So is social mobility something that you know, Chinese families can hope for, um, even if they understand that today they're much worse off um, than, than people who own you know, multi-million dollar apartments, many times multiple million dollar apartments in, in Beijing or Shanghai. You know, experiencing inequality, experiencing the downside of growth um, might not be so bad if, if one anticipates that, that you know, your children can do uh, a little bit better, or could, could become those successes in the next generation. Um, so you know, people all around the world, I think, you know, look at, at the, current, the, the current situation, they say, okay, you know, I don't know what my odds are, and, or I don't know what my kids' odds are, and maybe more importantly in China today, you get a feeling, and, and in America today, there, there's a sense that economic opportunity isn't what it used to be. Um, that's our feeling. Do we have data to back that up? So if we, if we say, you know, right now it doesn't feel like we have economic opportunity, looking back at history can tell us, you know, is that feeling, you know, borne out in the data? Uh, so I, I think that's useful um, just to, to put current uh, economic opportunity in context. The other aspect of, of history that, that is so useful, I think, is that we'd like to say, you know, is social mobility something that can be affected by policy? Um, if someone like Greg Clark looks back at, at you know, many instances um, of revolution, social change in England, revolution in China, um, you know, economic modernization all over the Western world and sees you know, fairly persistent social status across generations over long periods of time, you know, one might want to dig into that and, and history gives you, you know, some opportunity to say, okay, let, let's look at a few examples of, of policy changes, institutional changes, you know, economic policy changes that we think might might actually move social mobility. You know, history gives us you know, a set of you know, sort of, I, I don't want to use experiments in the randomization term, but a set of policy shocks that we can look back to uh, to learn about you know, what are the drivers of, of social mobility. You know, the contemporary environment may not give us very much variation. So you know, what do we do in this paper? Well, we look at, at uh, a context that I think is especially interesting you know, in, in a contemporary sense. So we're, we're gonna look at Chinese social mobility um, over the long run. Again, I kind of motivated this before, saying you know, social mobility in China is like a first order question or policy topic when you talk to, to people in, in China today. So you go to China, everybody understands that, that inequality has increased dramatically over the past 20 years. And then the next question is, well, is this being offset by, by at least some reasonable opportunity for, for social mobility? And many people are concerned that there isn't th this sort of opportunity. So we're going to look back at China's 20th century and say, well, you know, how does Chinese social mobility today look compared to what it was over the past you know, 50 to 70 years? Does it look high? Does it look low? Um, and, and the next thing that, that we'll do is we'll say, okay, given that we can, we can document patterns of social mobility over you know, many generations, I'll show you in a second, kids born from, from the 1930s through the 1980s, if we can document those patterns, we can begin to learn something about what these sort of dramatic institutional changes have done to social mobility. Is it, is it the case that you look at China, which had you know, as much political upheaval um, and, and sort of policy upheaval in the 20th century as just about anywhere, is it the case that social mobility was kind of stubborn and, and low? Um, that's, that's one of the questions we'll ask. And so we have these three distinct regimes um, in, in China's you know, 20th century, beginning in the 20s. You could add a fourth if we had data going back. Uh, but Republican China um, is, is going to be one regime that we're going to look at uh, where, where we see sort of kids who are educated between 1930 um, and ending in the early 1950s. So the first five-year education plan under the Communist Party um, is implemented in 1953, the revolutions in 49. So, so Republican China, kids educated prior to the 50s, you know, beginning in 1930. Maoist China, kids who are educated under the Communist Party, but prior to the reforms of Deng Xiaoping, um, and, and then reform China, kids who are educated in, in the late 70s and later. And so looking at these three regimes, I think we have you know, some opportunity to look at really interesting, you know, big, policy variation, uh, but, but given that, that I think we entered this with, with some sort of prior that social mobility you know, isn't going to move very much, we wanted to study some of these big you know, policy shocks like a communist revolution, like a massive economic experiment of, of opening um, in, in the late 70s. So how can we look at social mobility over, over you know, 70 years of birth cohorts? Well, we're going to use a retrospective 
representative survey of, of urban Chinese. So this is a Chinese urban household education and employment survey. The survey uh, was conducted in 2004. Um, and the nice thing about it, as I'll talk about in a little bit, it's retrospective. So you have information on household heads, you have information on household heads' parents, information on household heads' kids, um, and that gives us actually a, a pretty broad range of cohorts. I'll talk more about it. Um, in addition to, to looking at patterns of social mobility among urban Chinese, uh, we're going to look at, at sort of complementary evidence on rural Chinese. So, so the Chinese household uh, urban uh, survey was nice because we have a sufficient sample of, of kids uh, born between the 1930s and the mid 80s. We, there isn't a, a similar sample uh, with similar sample sizes for early birth cohorts uh, and late birth cohorts um, for a single rural source, but combining two rural data sources, um, we can actually get pretty good coverage. So, you know, what we're going to do is, is look at intergenerational correlations in socioeconomic status. We're going to proxy for socioeconomic status using educational attainment. Um, so, you know, there are some good things about looking at educational attainment and some bad things. You know, one good thing is educational attainment uh, is measured more precisely than income. So educational attainment is something that, that you know, is, is completed by a certain age. Um, there's less measurement error. And, and in addition, because educational attainment occurs at a certain age, it's very easy to link you know, the outcome we care about, education levels, to a particular institutional regime when that education was completed. With income, you have, you know, the determinants of income you know, definitely can cross over institutional regimes, whereas for some people at least, um, it's going to be very clear under which regime they, they went to school. So, so that's a nice aspect of using education. Um, in addition, we have just, just a lot more data. Um, so we're going to look at education levels and education ranks. Um, so instead of just looking at how many years of school you have, we look at your rank within a cohort, both for the kids and for the parents, and, and that's going to be nice because you have changes in the distribution of education across time. So it doesn't mean the same thing to get one year of schooling uh, if you're in an early cohort as, as it does in a late cohort. You know, educational uh, attainment distributions can, can compress. So um, we're going to look at a bunch of, of specifications and we find pretty much the same pattern. And, and that's this sort of pattern here. So this is one of the graphs. I'll talk to you more about where this comes from in a bit. But basically what you see here plotted um, are five-year rolling windows of correlations between parents' education or father's education and kids' education. Um, so you know, a point like this would say the correlation between, or, or the coefficient actually, um, on father's education for kids born between 1930 and, and 1934 would be something like 0.33. So an additional year of father's education gives you about you know, 0.3, or you know, in this range here, between 0.2 and 0.3 extra years of schooling for kids educated in the Republican era. Sorry, to be clear, this is year of birth. So kids born you know, up through like 1945 are being educated in the Republican era. Kids born after 45 and through something like 1965 are educated in the Maoist era. Kids born after 65 are, are educated in the Reform era. Should have been clear, sorry about that. So um, in the, re in the uh, Republican era, for every year of father's education, kids are predicted to get about 0.2 to 0.3 more years of schooling. That falls dramatically um, for, for kids born and educated in, in the Maoist era. So for kids educated in the Maoist era, uh, a, a year of father's education only gives you, you know, around 0.15 years of schooling for kids, um, and that, that turns around in, in the post-reform era. So we're going we're gonna to dig into this um, a lot in the talk. Um, but you know, the, the main finding in, in the paper is just you know, starting with this descriptive fact that there is this you know, pretty dramatic and, and robust U-shaped uh, pattern of, of status persistence across time. Um, you know, as I said, social mobility low in the Republican era, you know, much higher in the Maoist era and, and lower again in the post-reform era, about as low as it was during the Republican era. So, so for you know, contemporary Chinese wondering, like, you know, is, is social mobility you know, reasonable now? Do we have economic opportunities right now? The answer is you, know, you have you know, far less mobility than your parents had. Um, and in fact, you have so little mobility that it begins to look like Republican China, which was seen as like a very elite dominated uh, society. Um, you know, I'll show you we find similar patterns in rural China, um, and, and you know, I'll, I'll talk more about that in a little bit. So you know, what you might ask um, about the data, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, is, is sort of you know, a, a series of questions about what's, what's behind this U-shape. So you know, there, there are a bunch of data questions um, that, that we're able to answer. So one is, you know, is this all about 
you know, differential measurement error. So you worry comparing intergenerational coefficients across time. You know, in, in older data, there's more measurement error. You're going to have smaller coefficients. But again, like in, in our oldest data, where you'd expect the most noise, we actually have larger coefficients. So it doesn't seem like we're getting you know, this, this you know, low intergenerational transmission in, in the, the Maoist era just coming from you know, more noise in the data. Um, you know, is it the case that all of this is the cultural revolution, which you might see as sort of like a measurement error question or an external validity question, or just, uh, you know, is your punchline destroying educational institutions is, is a good thing for, for social mobility? That's not the punchline. So, so two things. One, yeah, j that's very important. Yeah, you don't just want to destroy educational institutions for, for the CD fellows. So, you know, <laughs> um, yeah, so, so, um, you know, so a couple of things. We dropped the 50 to 59 cohorts who were most affected by the Cultural Revolution. So kids born between 45 and 50 um, were educated after the, the first communist five-year plan was implemented, and most of them would have completed their, their education prior to the, the deaths of the Cultural Revolution really shutting down schools. Um, we still see a lot of mobility among those cohorts. Um, and, and in addition, just what you see in the raw data and, and this might be surprising to some of you, um, is that educational attainment continues to increase even for, for kids who are getting educated during the Cultural Revolution. So a lot of the most dramatic, um, the, the, the most dramatic events of the Cultural Revolution that, that we think about were like the, the shutting down of universities, the shutting down of certain high schools, um, but, but for the most part, certainly primary schools were opened throughout the Cultural Revolution. Middle schools were opened you know, almost entirely through the Cultural Revolution. High schools were barely closed. Colleges were shut down for a while, but that affects a, a relatively small fraction of our population in the 60s and 70s. And so you do see education increasing throughout this period. It's not just the case that we get low correlations between parents and kids' education in, in the 60s because kids are getting zero education or something like that. That's just not the case. Uh, finally, one thing that, that we think is kind of nice um, is that we can you know, ask it, you know, of a few data sources, um, is it the case that uh, educational status is actually a measure of, of socioeconomic status across time? So, so a natural question as well, you know, in the 50s and 60s and 70s, during your Maoist era, you find low intergenerational transmission of educational status, and you interpret that as, as low status transmission. But maybe there is status transmission through other mechanisms. Maybe education wasn't actually an important indicator of socioeconomic status during the Maoist era. Um, and I'll, I'll show you that, that we, can, we, we find positive returns to schooling sort of throughout the, the time period. Um, so you know, how do we interpret this? Well, you know, the, the, you know, as I said, the, the main purpose of the paper was just to sort of document this, this pattern, uh, the U-shaped pattern of, of status transmission across time. You know, social mobility does seem to respond to institutional changes and to policy changes that I'll talk about, um, but it's going to be hard for us to point to specific causal factors. Um, what we will do is discuss, and I think this is you know, going to be of some interest to, to the fellows, and, and for me it's, it's like the interesting sort of policy relevant aspect of the paper, um, is sort of a, a political economy process that produced different types of educational expansions in, in China's 20th century. So you know, one thing that, that I think we, we really naturally think about, and this is, this is something based on, on work by, by Claudia Golden and Larry Katz, is that when you see economic inequality, when you see low social mobility, what you want to do is win the race between technology and education, something like that, and expand schooling. And, and something that, that's really interesting about China's 20th century is that you'll see different types of schooling expansion um, that are associated with different social mobility consequences. And so you know, what, what we're going to say is sort of the details of educational policy matter, the details of education expansion matter as well. And so, you know, what you see is, you know, post-49, this is the educational expansion that leads to, to increased social mobility or reduced status persistence. You see this sort of mass targeted schooling at the primary level all the way up to Tsinghua, as I'll show you. In, in the case of, of post-79, surprisingly, as I'll show you, surprisingly to us, educational expansion continues pretty much unabated. China's spending a ton of money on schools in the 80s, in the 90s, and today, but, but it's a very, very differently oriented educational expansion. It's much more elite oriented. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, the policy punchline. So what, what does this contribute to? There, there's a huge literature um, on social mobility. I gave you some sites before, um, some sites now. There, there's a big literature, unsurprisingly, on China. As I said, like, people in China are sort of obsessed with this question of, of is there social mobility and how does social mobility today compare to what, what they had before? So people you know, aren't yet looking back longingly 
uh, to the days of Mao, but, but given what's happening in the Soviet Union, that, that might be like a decade away. So, um, you know, you, you never know. Former Soviet Union, sorry. Uh, so, so, okay, so, so in China, there's, there's this big literature. You know, to, to that, what we contribute is, is a, a longer run study. So, so papers haven't yet had the chance um, to look back across all three of these regimes. So, so I think that, that the, the U-shaped pattern that, that we find is really new. There's been some evidence that social mobility decreased or that status persistence increased in recent decades, but it was hard to put that in the perspective of like, what, what were things like before the communists took power. And so that's something new that we do. And, and we, we put together a bunch of new data sources to talk about urban and rural China um, and, and also sort of address more of these measurement questions um, that, that I think hasn't really been addressed or haven't really been addressed. In, in the literature. So um, I'll, I'll go through this. this. This is all pretty fast, actually. I mean, the, the basic pattern of the U is, is what I'll focus on. I'll tell you a little bit about the data, uh, talk about our urban uh, results, talk about you know, what rural China looked like. I'll show you that, that the returns to education were positive across uh, our, our institutional regimes. Um, and then I'll talk to you about the, the educational policy stuff, um, which, which I think is, is some of the most interesting, even though it's the most speculative. So, OK, what, what's our data? Well, so we have um, this, this representative uh, sample of, of urban households, data collected by uh, a collaboration of the National Bureau of Statistics and, and Peking University. Um, you know, I, I don't want to say too much about this. I think just the, the main thing is it's, it's a cool survey because the, the survey questions ask household heads about their parents and about their kids. So, so what can that get us? Well, we can get cohorts born as early as the 20s in our data set, and we have information about their parents. Why? Because if you have a really old household head who's like 80 years old in, in 2004, that 80-year-old household head is a, a 1920s birth cohort and their parents' uh, information is also available uh, in the survey. Now, I, I will talk to you about like selective mortality and stuff like that. Um, question? OK. Um, so so Nico, Nico gets two minutes of my time during my talk, just for the record. Oh. So um, you, you have your, just ra wave your hand. So um, you know, we also have, have later births. Um, uh, coming from, from the kids of household heads or from, from young household heads, um, and, and we use them all. So we don't use later than 1984 because uh, the cohorts are small. They were 20 years old at the time of the survey, and, and you'll see actually that, that already for the latest cohorts, you can see the effects of, of incomplete education. Um, I'll show you that in graphs in a little bit. So you know, we, we use demographic information, you know, age obviously, um, we'll control for gender and, and Communist Party membership status. Um, and, you know, obviously, again, education. So it's nice. There, there's, you know, pretty detailed information on years of schooling completed. Uh, we convert that into ranks uh, for robustness. And, and the way we, we calculate ranks is we calculate the rank of a kid within their five-year birth cohort. And then among the parents of those kids, we'll calculate a parent's rank. Um, we've, we've used logs, as, as I note. So um, there, there are some, some good labor market uh, outcome data but they don't go back as far as, as education. So we have current income in 2004. You can imagine for the older people, they're not working. Um, we do, you know, this is kind of cool, have final pre-retirement income for people who are retired or, or deceased. Um, and so, you know, we, and the, the survey also tells us which year was that year of their last earnings. And so this gives us a little bit of time varying information on income, uh, which we'll use in, in a, uh, to, to think about the returns to schooling. Um, I'll, I'll just skip summary stats. If people have questions, they can ask me. So, uh, but, but it's a representative sample of urban Chinese. Kids are, are a little bit richer and more educated than their parents. Um, so OK, what do we do for, for, uh, urban, for, for our urban data analysis? So you know, what we're going to do is focus on, again, I said we're going to look at education as our measure of social status for kids and parents. We're going to look at father's education. We could also look at average of fathers and mothers. Uh, but for especially the, the very oldest cohorts, um, there was, there's a lot of you know, zeros for the moms. And so we thought this was, this was better. Um, so, but, but our results aren't sensitive to that. So um, you know, again, I told you, there, there are some nice things about looking at education instead of income. Um, and you know, we, again, we use father's education. So um, moving on. So, so what do we do? Well, you, yeah, of course, of course, of course. <laughs> Rather than before high social status, you would go for 
11 and also for seven for six. So this could just mechanically give you the result, right? Yeah, yeah, no, so, so the... The, the distribution is not is not changing like that. No, no. And and so so you know we do look at at ranks and and ranks could be lumpy a little bit in that sense. Um, but we don't have sort of you know lumps in the data in, in the more continuous data that that sound like what what you're talking about. And then also becomes another way to address this. I guess is with your professional outcomes, right? But we're we're not looking. At, I mean, we could look at professional outcomes actually for the recent period. That's a good idea. Just to yeah. No, 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 but that, that's a good idea. So, so we, could, we could show, so we, we don't have great data going far back on, on labor market outcomes, jobs, and, uh, and earnings, but we can at least look at some correspondence uh, for, recent, for, for the recent transition. So for the Republican, it'd be hard, but from Maoist to post-reforms, we could do that. So in the paper, we also show uh, income uh, as a measure of status for both groups, for, for fathers and sons. Again, only for the, the Maoist and the reform era. Um, and the results look very similar, actually. Similar magnitudes. Um, OK. That's a good idea. Good, good use of 10 seconds. Thank you. Um, so I, I wish all of my 10 seconds were that long. So then, then I'd be able to go through all my results. So, so OK, I'm not going to go through all my results. OK, basically, you know, we, we have this, this, uh, this set of regression coefficients. We're estimating five year. So you know, the starting point is going to be looking you know, separately at five year cohorts, estimate separate coefficients on parent schooling in a regression of parent schooling predicting kids schooling. Um, we do this you know, again with, with ranks instead of levels of schooling. We do it with controls and without controls. Um, and I'm going to show you sort of the, the, rolling, uh, the, the rolling estimates on, on father's education. Um, OK, as I said, ranks and, and levels. Um, we include controls for, for gender, kids' Communist Party membership, parents' Communist Party membership, and quadratic controls for, for parents' and kids' ages. Um, this is just the level result, which I showed you before. Without controls, we get this U-shape. If you include controls, things don't change very much. If you look at ranks, it looks very similar. I just knew I would be sort of short on time, but, but the ranks results are in the paper, um, and, and they look quite similar. Um, so that was looking separately at, at five-year cohort. So for a given five-year birth cohort, what's the relationship between parents and kids' education? Five years at a time. We also show regression results in the table where we pool all of our cohorts and just look at you know, the interaction between a birth cohort dummy variable and parent schooling um, and controlling for um, a range of, of different controls, including you know, in, the, in the paper I show this, um, not, not in the presentation, uh, controls for like, like province cohort fixed effects and things like that. So only using the within province variation uh, in, in parents' uh, education for a given cohort. Um, so that's what, what this looks like. So we're interested in the coefficient on parents' education, predicting kids' education, um, and we're letting that coefficient be time-varying, uh, controlling for cohort fixed effects in a range of, of time-varying controls. Um, what I'm going to show you is comparison. So, so you saw that U-shape. I didn't show you standard errors on that. Um, you might be interested in what, what do these standard errors look like. So what I'm going to show you is uh, coefficients for the different regimes and standard errors for those regimes, differencing across regimes. So, so in particular, what I'm going to show you is the difference in, in the, the coefficient on parents' education for the Republican cohorts versus the Maoist, and the Maoist versus the reform coefficient. So is it the case that um, we have, on average, different coefficients on father's education for the Republican births versus the Maoist births versus the reform births? Um, and and what's, the, what's the standard error on that? And then I'm going to show you those differences with standard errors dropping the Cultural Revolution birth cohort. So, so you'll see what I mean here. So you, know, you saw before in the picture that, on average, the, the coefficient uh, on father's education for the Republican educated kids was something like, you know, between 0.2 and 0.3. During the, the Maoist era, um, we had a coefficient somewhere around 0.15. It turns out when you, when you estimate that difference in the pooled model, you get a difference of 0.089. So something like an additional point, you know, to round up, uh, 0.1 more years of schooling for a kid uh, for a given year, for, for one more year of father's education in the pre-Mao period as opposed to the Maoist period uh, with a standard error of 0 0.051. And, and this is the difference between the post-Mao period and the Maoist period. So again, something like you know, 0 0.1 to round. Um, and these are, are sort of you know, either significant or marginally significant. Um, when you include controls, the differences get a little bit bigger. 
when you drop the Cultural Revolution cohorts, the difference between the pre-Mao and the Mao or the Republican and the Mao you know, drop a little bit. Uh, the differences between the post-Mao or post-reform in the Mao period drops a little bit, um, but, but you know, qualitatively the results are actually quite similar. So, okay, you know, what, what does this mean? I, sh I should move a little bit. Um, you know, the, the magnitudes, I think, are not trivial. So if you think about um, you know, looking at a, a high school or versus college-educated parent, what's the impact of that in different regimes? Well, it's going to be you know, almost half a year of schooling. Uh, difference ac across regimes, uh, having a, a parent who's college educated versus high school in the Maoist regime versus, versus one of the others. So um, let me talk about selection because I think that's kind of interesting. Wow, I, yeah, I, I think selection is interesting. I'm not going to talk about it much. I think that selection, uh, differential selection into our sample by cohort and, and status, I think actually if, if we accounted for it, our U shape would, would be even more pronounced. I'm happy to talk to you about that during questions. Um, <laughs> Rural China. So as I said, we don't have one, one data set that covers all of the cohorts of interest. We combine two. One is the World Bank Living Standards Measurement Survey um, that Hertz and, and co-authors use. Um, and the other is the, the Charles data set, which is an aging and retirement survey um, of, of Chinese. The Charles is urban and rural, and we'll look at the rural setting, uh, at, at the rural subjects. So this is what you get. So in, in the, the World Bank data, that covers the older cohorts, you generally get declining uh, coefficients or declining correlations between parents and kids' status. Um, in the Charles data, you have increasing uh, coefficients on, on parent status predicting kids' status. Um, and this black line is, is our urban line using the same specification for comparison. Um, so you know, roughly similar patterns. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the returns to schooling. Uh, so you might wonder, what do the returns to schooling look like in Republican China? What do they look like um, in Maoist China? Um, so what we have is, is a data set from the, the Jinpu Railroad that, that uh, a, a Harvard professor gave to me long ago um, that, that has information on earnings um, and schooling. And you can estimate a return to schooling uh, from this 1929 uh, set of employee records. You find a positive coefficient. If you look at the Maoist period, looking at our urban household uh, data from, from our own survey, you find, again, a positive and significant coefficient, and that's not driven by, by Communist Party status, which, which we think is important. If you look at the post-Mao era, looking again at the same sort of outcome variable, the last income before retirement, you find actually a very similar magnitude, again, not driven by Communist Party status. So let me just say, you know, for now I can answer questions about this. We do see positive significant returns to schooling across, uh, across our time periods. So, you know, as I said, you might think expanding education. No, no. Just going back to this table, so if you, if you consult for parents' education and you put your own years of schooling, do you see that parents' education matters on top? Mm. You see what I mean? That, because that would be a way to... to yeah, we, we have... So parents' education and kids' education as explanatory variables, yeah. and, and kids' income as the outcome. Exactly. And then if parents' education matters on top of your own income, then you can see whether there's another channel of this education by which your parents' status affects your own. Other than the fact that we're, we're running to an endogenous variable on the right-hand side, which we worry about. But yes, we can, we'll do that. We'll do that. So OK, educational expansion. Is it the case that, that educational expansion is behind the, the increase in social mobility that we see after the 1950s? Is it the case, let's say, that educational contraction uh, or spending contraction is, is what we see you know, post-70s, and that's leading to a reduction in social mobility? I've already hinted that's not the case. So you know, what you see here is just from our urban data set, what's happening to average years of schooling over uh, across our birth cohorts. And this is you know, just rescaled to be an index at 100. Um, what's happening uh, to uh, status persistence? So you know, we see that, that, social, that, that education levels are going up as, uh, as status persistence declines, as social mobility increases. But we see that educational attainment continues to go up, with the exception of this last sort of unfinished education cohort at the end, um, as uh, social mobility declines or status persistence increases. Um, so what's happening? Well, different expansions are benefiting different groups of kids. So what you see here in red is the education genie. So within the cohort, 
how equally distributed is, is the education level um, across kids. And what you see is during the, the, the transition into the Maoist period, you see a declining education genie. So, so education is becoming more equally distributed. Starting in the, the 1965 birth cohort, you begin to see an uptick um, a slight uptick, admittedly, um, in the education genie. This one is, is low, but again, I think that's because you know, the kids who are getting the highest levels of education who are gonna be driving up the genie haven't completed their, their education yet. So once the, the later birth courts complete their education, I would actually expect this to go up and, and that to go up. And so you, know, you see this, this pattern in the genie that says you know, educational expansion during the communist era didn't look like educational expansion uh, in the, in the post-reform era. And there's some qualitative evidence of this. So this is you know, what happened to class backgrounds of Tsinghua students. So Tsinghua is one of the, the elite universities in China. Uh, when the communists took power, a relatively small fraction of kids came from worker peasant backgrounds. You know, by the time the, the Communist Party you know, wiped out entrance exams, instituted affirmative action at the college level and at earlier levels, um, they, they got this number up to, to 40%. So the really dramatic change in, in the class background um, of kids at, at China's you know, second most or most elite university. Um, what's happening today. So what, what I'm plotting here um, is, a, is an opportunity index. This is kind of convoluted. But basically, a higher number here means more university slots. Um, okay, uh, more university slots. And what I'm showing is differences in, in university slots for the three richest Chinese sort of autonomous sort of provincial level municipalities, Tianjin, Beijing, and Shanghai. All of these numbers are much bigger um, than the rest of China. So these, the richest municipalities in China have access to university seats that, that regular Chinese don't. And this is true at every level of education, from, from high school slots that don't allow every rural Chinese person to, to even attend high school, let alone graduate high school, to, uh, to the college level. So summary and, and implication. So, so I've given you the summary. There is this U-shape. Social mobility seems like something that, that does change over time. And, and it seems to, to vary with uh, institutions and, and with policies. Um, and you know, so, so what do you want to think about? Well, you, know, you want to think about the details of educational expansion. So you know, what I want to emphasize maybe for, for a policy audience is expansion need not be equalizing. Um, it depends on you know, who is targeted. And, and this kind of brings up a broader political economy question of you know, what kind of educational institutions do you want? And China is thinking about this very question today. So you know, China is investing a lot in elite higher educational institutions with the goal of developing this, this you know, technically advanced uh, elite who, who can innovate. And, and that's you know, one way to modernize an economy, one way to generate growth and innovation. Um, it's also something that politically benefits the current elite. So the rich in China benefit a lot from the very best universities in China getting a disproportionate amount of education spending. You know, on the other hand, what, what else can you do? Well, you could try to expand schooling for the lower end of the distribution. Politically, why is that good? Well, it might reduce social unrest, and that might be good. It might also just be the right thing to do. Um, in addition, there's this question of, you know, is it the case uh, that, that China is going to be stuck with a massive population in rural areas who aren't skilled enough to do any sort of factory work. As factory work moves to Africa and other parts of Southeast Asia, you know, there is a question of like, the, the sort of lack of skills um, in the, the broader Chinese masses. So China might be aiming too high by aiming at this sort of elite education. And so you know, just you know, last thing um, you know, for, for policymakers, like political economy trade-offs between you know, education policies that, that might favor an elite or might generate certain types of human capital versus educational investments uh, that might benefit the masses, produce a different type of human capital. Like that, that, I think, is a really relevant political economy policy dimension to think about. Um, and, and I think you know, an interesting aspect of this is that the incentives of elites and others aren't always perfectly aligned. So worth thinking about. Thanks. Thanks, you many things among them. Don't make me go and offer if you don't want to be accepted. <laughs> and, then, and then push it. And then push it. Two questions. OK. Um, so I don't know what happened in the Cultural Revolution, but I had the feeling that certain educated people in the countryside, yeah. I expect their children suffering as a result of that. Um, and, and that would be kind of a randomly scrambling of the social order, which is the risk, which is the risk of the country. Um, yeah. So is that what we're seeing in the Maoist period? Or, or so, is so, really a nice, healthy uh, mobility where the 
So again, so so the the for for the the 45 to 50 cohort, most of those kids are completing their schooling, and we could we could even truncate the the very highest end, you know, both social status and educational outcomes groups um, to see how much. Uh, yeah, this this uh, sort of sending sending into into the countryside mattered, um, but as I said, like education is increasing throughout the period. I, I don't think that this is just like you are you are kind of destroying human capital or distorting human capital for a significant subset of the population. I think there is some of that, and and it matters. Um, but I think a lot of that would matter kind of at the very high end. Um, it's also the case that that for many of those people who were sent sent down essentially many of them would come back eventually. Um, and then they, they, there was a massive cohort of applicants actually uh, to the college entrance exam. So in like 78, I believe, there was the first uh, reinstituted college entrance exam uh, in China. And, and it's kind of like a famous cohort because it was so selective to get in because you had all these people whose education was disrupted. And, and many of them would at least try to, to get in, you know, if not in that first exam, over, over the next several cohorts. So, so there was some catching up of, of educational accumulation in the early 80s. But I think we, what, we, what we can do more of is sort of thinking about people with, with particular class backgrounds um, and people at a certain part of the distribution. Uh, so we'll do that. Yeah, sure. I would just spend time just thinking about the genetic. So, you know, so as, uh, you know, this persistence coefficient by, you know, those with a low education, medium education, high education, by education. So basically, mapping. More description. Given that it's description, exactly. make yeah. the full picture and then, you know, let, let people decide what they find most interesting. And mm -hmm. also, you saw with this data, you can get like the parents to experience and how they change over time, right? Because they know how old they, they are, how many years they've been working, could look by interact by occupation. So, in some sense, you can. Give like to, to, to researchers on on mobility in China the, the full plate and uh, and they let them import what they want. Okay. Um, so comment and questions. The comment is you do the gene for education, which seems a little weird because the average level of education is rising, but then mechanically lower the gene. You know, we think like But the genie goes up as as educational attainment goes up toward the, the end of our sample. D part, that's confounded by that. Yeah, yeah, got it. Yeah, 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 yeah. You think that it's log wages that respond to um, years of education, and you really want to know the standard deviation of education. Okay. Um, and the other thing is... That looks the same, by the way. So, so you have this generation where you have fathers and sons, you have yeah. three generations, um, and it seems like that's just a, a incredible opportunity to look at the extent to which um, you know, mobility across two generations doesn't look like the product of the single generation mobility thing, which almost certainly doesn't. Um, yep. You know, from what we know, there's kind of a lot of persistence in grandparents' generations and children's generations. That would be really cool. Yep. Yeah, that was exactly the same question of uh, can you because you have the Maoist period interrupting sort of being the big change. If you can link across the Maoist period from before and to after. Do you see exactly the story that you just gave about sort of those children were punished or the children of the people were punished coming back? Yeah. Skelios' question plus the word gender. Um, <laughs> okay. So does my mom's education matter more if I'm a girl? Does my dad's education matter more post one child policy? All sorts of stuff. Okay. So I, I will say I will say sorry just that that some of these descriptive points so so that's that's not something that will be easy for us to get at across like across regimes so we could give you the the overall uh, like certain overall patterns and pre post one child policy we might be able to do so some of this I would say uh, for the recent period has been done by in the sociology literature more than the economics literature there are some economists who kind of dabble in both areas but. Um, yeah, I, w I would say, you know, so the very long run aspect, so, so the fact that we have three generations is something where we have more of a, of a comparative advantage. Um, although, although having information on, on mothers and fathers, I think could be something that's relatively unexplored, although people actually have looked at it. So I, I should know more about what, what people have found in the basic descriptives. 
Um, but that would be a little less new for us. It would be, it would be cool to look at that across regimes, like the older regimes, uh, but then the cells get quite small, actually. Sorry, Marcy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, rather than hand waving. Yeah. We're almost done, so I think there's one thing that would give me a chance to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, I would, uh, and maybe to give you a chance to talk about selection bias. Because when you said you were using an urban uh, sample, yeah. I was thinking so much of the story, so many of the stories we hear about income mobility in China are about moving to the urban areas. Yep. And so I was wondering what that does. Yeah, no, it's a great question. So, so, you know, we do a couple things to think about that. Um, you know, one is we look only at the natives. So, so we have one, one set of results where we look only at kids who get their hukou status, which is their urban registration by age two. We also look at, at families where the parent had urban, hukou, urban registration by age two, um, and the results actually look quite similar. So, so that, that's one, one step. The next step is, you know, look at, at other papers that, that have studied you know, that, that have studied migration more specifically. And so one of the things you find is that actually in the, in the post-reform period, you know, there, there haven't been changes in rural to urban migration. So it wasn't the case that, sorry, I mean, it, at, at least, so I, I should be clear about what I mean there. So um, there, there haven't been changes in hukou policy. So at, at, the, at the very highly skilled level, uh, people who are coming into Beijing, let's say, um, are more likely to be skilled. They often come to Beijing specifically for school, and then they get to stay there because they get a job. And so there's, there's definitely this component of migrants who are upwardly socially mobile. Um, what people have found is that that, that component of, of social mobility actually hasn't changed that much from post-cultural revolution um, into, into the current era. So it's been, it's been pretty steady. Where you see a lot of rural to urban migration is in the unofficial migrants. Um, and so that, that is something I would admit that, that we're missing to some extent. And, and I think that that's something um, that, that we, we could acknowledge more. So, you know, that, yeah, I, I think that that's a, a great point. So unofficial migrants in recent decades um, have opened up, you know, one certain channel of mobility um, that we, we don't do too much to study. Although, you know, when you look at education levels, as, as I showed you, in rural areas, average education levels, at least across cohorts, are following the same patterns um, as in urban areas. So I, I don't think that, that the rural to urban migration is, is offsetting any of this, um, at, at least not completely offsetting it, but uh, that, that is a, an, an element that we don't say too much about, but we could, we could say more. I mean, this is something that, that people have studied a lot, actually. Alan DeBrow is one, one of the people who, who has a lot of data on, on how many people are moving and what they're getting from it. Uh, Alan DeBrow, I should note, it was from Williams and not from Brown. So, <laughs> but, but, but thank you all for coming. Thank you to the CDE fellows and to all our participants. And you know, thank you. Thanks. Thanks.